Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be in the world. A little bit late uh, this evening because we're gathering our thoughts and we're waiting for Richard Parker from Altitude Angel, who's been and gone to our chat on the side, uh, mostly gone. Um, well, oh, and I must say as well, uh, Ian's in the pub, I believe. Uh, he's had some issues today, uh, so fair play in the pub. And Mr. Simpson has got a sick note. Well, he's not got a sick note because he's not sick, but he has got a note. He sent it in. Uh, here it is. And I know where he is, and I think that'll be the subject of a video of his coming up shortly. So I won't reveal that, dear viewer. Oh, here comes Richard. Maybe or maybe not. There can comes Richard. Up? I can hear you, Richard. Yes, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. Apologies. I don't think the camera is going to work tonight, but um, if it does come back into life, I will, I will plug it back in and get it working. All right, perfect. No dramas at all. All right, first things first. I did... Did everyone see or did anyone see, and the usual crowd aren't here, so you probably won't, the crazy handheld controller that an astronaut has put up as being a good thing? Uh, what's it called? I can't remember. I have to click to look. Uh, it's called the FT Aviator. Any thoughts on that? Mm, can't say that I've seen it. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Just, just, just to sidetrack a little bit. Okay. Um, that guy with the small big Hulk uh, thingy that was last week, Philip. Philip, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that guy. Yes. Uh, the design yeah, that guy. The are yes. they? Are they uh, also releasing some sort of remote control that's got like twenty kilometers of HD range or something? Wasn't yes. that his company? That's right. Yes. Yes. Damn it. Yes I, forgot, yes, I forgot to ask him about it last week, and I was hoping he's going to be on this time. Um, <laughs> do, you, right, do, you remember, do you remember that bit last week where you spoke to us before we started and he was there? Yeah. And then we yeah, went exactly. and did it afterwards. Do you remember that bit? Do you remember how that works? All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you, I remember you, the next morning. <laughs> if, you, if you care to watch the video, you'll see it does all look quite quite groovy and uh, particularly the second version which is going to have two uh, not one but two hd uh, links uh and mad rc says looks like a thing you're not sure it's going to really fill much of a market when it's more of a slave rc no well it's it what it does is it uh, i believe what it does is it uh, removes the need for a lot of wiring um it's just mm -hmm. just one mm -hmm. one set of one set of wires yeah. for the flight controller and there's yeah. your 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 flight controller connected up along with your uh, Plug in a couple of cameras and away you go. Jobs are good. Um, so, yes, exactly. if you'd like to find more about that, look at last week's program. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the controller, so if you haven't seen the controller, it's a crazy idea. It's like a handheld joystick, and I really don't understand the point of it at all. But it's it's advocated by an astronaut, so it must be cool. <laughs> must be, yeah. It must be. It must be. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's take it that nobody's. Uh, Greetings from a burning California. Oh, yes. Sorry sorry to hear about all that in California. Um, yeah, it's bad, bad news over there, Richard. And I see a couple of people. Oh, the joystick one. Oh, Mad RC. Yes, it looks like a thingy. Not sure it's going to fill much of a market. No, I, I, I don't think it's going to be a thingy at all, really. Uh, but it's yet yeah, another Kickstarter thing. Uh, yeah, bad news in California. I see a company is already operating, offering satellite data for insurance uh, brokers and uh, various bits of software to to look for damage and assess damage beforehand. So a little bit of profiteering going on already, I think. But such is the way of the world. Right, anyway, let's move on to Walter. Walter is uh, from Airshaper, and you are, what, what's your real job? What, what's your title? What can we call you? Well, uh, depends on, on, on what time of day, maybe. Some call it founder, some call it uh, someone who has fun with this company, some call it CEO. For me, it doesn't matter. Uh, but um, I used to work for six years at a designer engineering company where we did uh, both physical and digital wind tunnel testing and then decided it was time uh, to found my own company uh, to make all these simulations more accessible. And drones happen to be a hot topic these days. And that's why we've done a few jobs in that area. Uh, and that's how we came to be in this session tonight. Absolutely. And in particular, you you have improved the performance of the EV. How much can you put a number on how much you yes. improved the performance? Yes. Yes. First, well, the way we work is that we, we did some tests on, on, on an older model uh, to have a baseline, to have a reference. 
And then we looked at, at some vortex structures that we saw in 3D, uh, mainly around the wingtips. Um, and although there already were uh, some winglets on the drone, um, we looked at different setups uh, and compared that to wind tunnel testing that, uh, that Sensefly had done themselves. Um, and by tuning and tweaking uh, different concepts in the end, um, we got an aerodynamic efficiency improvement of up to 30% regarding the lift over drag ratio. Um, and then they combined it with uh, improved battery technology. Um, and the thing now flies, flies up to, if I remember correctly, 90 minutes, something like that. So it, it was quite a massive jump in, in flight time. Uh, so we were surprised as well. We, we had our simulations, we, we uh, predicted uh, the improvement, uh, but in the end, in reality, it turned out to be an even bigger improvement. So we were quite happy with the results back there. Well, Sensefly must have been uh, absolutely delighted uh, with that then. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, and, and the cool thing is normally people come to us before they do an internal test and, and then at the end, because the test is quite expensive in the wind tunnel, then they move uh, to the physical final check. Uh, this time around, it was the opposite way. Uh, they had done testing already and, and had, had, had come across a certain problem with a, a certain vortex structure, and then asked for simulations to get more insight, because digitally, it's possible to visualize a lot more than you can in the wind tunnel, where you have to use smoke, for example, or a laser system uh, to do visualizations. So, uh, so when a wind tunnel's dying out then, uh, are you, no. Are you gonna, no? Why, no. Do, why do we still need them in the simulation is there? Well, they're, they're quite complementary. Um, in the wind tunnel, the downside is that you need a physical model, and, and that costs a lot of money. It costs time. Uh, even though you have 3D printing these days, you can go quite fast, but still the surface roughness and things like that uh, do matter. Um, on the other hand, you can test quite quickly different angles of attack and different uh, wind speeds in a wind tunnel. Uh, we, whereas digitally, you need to do a new simulation every time. So that's the upside of a wind tunnel. The upside of simulations is that you can do everything digitally. You don't have to produce anything. You can compare 10 different concepts at the same time, just push them into the cloud and, and look at the results uh, and do a parametric study, see, see wh wherever the optimum goes to. Uh, so they're quite complementary. Um, we have someone of Formula One in our advisory board, and he says, says the same. Uh, there's teams that rely on, on digital only, but it doesn't work. There's teams that, that may want to spend time only in the wind tunnel, but that doesn't work either. So the combination is, is what's powerful these days. So, if I, okay, I'm a drone manufacturer. I'm not sure, Dave, if you've got a bit of hum on your, your uh, microphone setup there. Don't know if it's you or someone else, the gentle no throbbing <laughs> war, war of the Worlds or something like that. The chance of any coming from Mars. So, all right, I'm a drone company, and I've. Uh, so, where do I start? Do I come to you then before we get to the expensive say, stage? So, I said, oh, look, I think this is what it's going to look like. What do you reckon? Can we make any uh, modifications before we bring it into the real world, or do we, or do we do as as uh, a Sensefly did and have it in the real world already? Well, depends on where you are. If you're an established manufacturer, then yes, you could probably use an existing drone as a, as a baseline and, and see where you can prove from there. Uh, but typically, we would start off in the conceptual phase, do a lot of simulations there, and, and we have three different levels of accuracy, uh, which are tuned to the different phases in product design. So if you're at the early stages and you're comparing very different shapes, let, let's say like a triangular platform versus uh, just a rectangular one, then you don't need as much accuracy to see the, to the, the differences. But if you move on uh, to a more detailed design and in the end start to prepare for a, a wind tunnel test, you want to increase the accuracy of the simulations uh, to capture smaller details. Uh, so we, we, we move along with these different phases of the design process until we get to the wind tunnel testing phase. And uh, well, um, Nicola is our man for, for testing airframes and doing all sorts of long range FPV stuff here. He's put all sorts of aerod aerodynamic devices on kit aircraft through a 3D printer. They're becoming quite popular. I don't know if you've come across them at all. And I don't know whether you have any idea or any thoughts on whether they're pure nonsense or effective. Well, uh, uh, we did. Maybe you've seen it. We've done a few uh, YouTube videos on, on drone design and on, on aerodynamics in general. And one of the previous things we did was to test uh, vortex generators uh, because they tend to influence the flow quite a lot. And we 
uh, well, I have an old beetle, a 1970s beetle, and uh, we thought we'd use that one as a test subject, and we put them at the rear end of the roof uh, because the vortex generators uh, tend to create a more turbulent flow so that it would stick to the downward angle of the rear window of the beetle uh, because it, it looks aerodynamic, but it isn't at all, <laughs> the old beetle. Um, the, the rear angle is way too steep for the flow to stay attached. And when we put the vortex generators on it, uh, we did see, using some tufts on the rear window, uh, that it stayed attached uh, in a better way. Uh, so they do tend to work. Uh, still, the question is if the overall drag was reduced or not. Um, but some of these features can really work. Uh, but we also saw that it, the, the placement is very critical. Just moving them up and down a few centimeters on the roof already made a huge difference uh, in the behavior of the tufts. So yes, I, I do believe that some of these aftermarket uh, things can work, but I also believe that you need to apply them properly um, and, and critically monitor them uh, to see, or, or assess their performance to see if it's really worth it. Yeah. What's your thoughts, Seth? Nicola. Mine? Well, um, one example of such uh, modifications is actually the uh, nano talon uh, that's right there on the table right now. People have been modding the hell out of this thing because out of the box it flies, it flies well, it flies efficiently, it flies for long, but it shakes like crazy. And in an attempt to fix that, People have come up with fen fences, vortex generators, winglets, uh, straight wing mods, and all of these parts are printed, designed to make this thing fly like, uh, for instance, a two kilogram plane, where in fact it is a 500 gram plane. Thing is, um, so far, my experience with modding this thing has been kind of, I don't know, underwhelming. There are some. There is an effect from these mods, but not what some people are claiming to have achieved. And I've seen videos of other people's uh, flights after the mods. They do appear to be quite stable, but really I can't understand exactly why it works in one place and it doesn't work in another place. And I think this comes back to what, um, what Walter said that these things need to be applied properly and the way we do it it's not very scientific <laughs> somebody comes up with something they say wow look at that shows a uh, sunset flight where conditions are pretty much absolutely perfect no wind no thermals no turbulence no nothing and the plane flies as if i've taken it a kilometer up in the sky and uh, it does fly very well even even you know stock with the wings at uh, with the dihedro and no strakes and nothing at all at 700 meters of altitude when the conditions are right nano talent feels like you know at some point you think okay my my screen is frozen it just doesn't move problem is when it's close to the ground and when you show a flight at i don't know uh, eight o'clock in the evening during sunset on a perfect evening that's not really indicative for me um some people watching this might uh recognize what i'm talking about <laughs> i'm not gonna quote any names but you know that's just me um based on what i've seen from other uh from other people on youtube but I don't know. It just depends on how you're going to use this. If you if you really want to fly close to the ground, yes, do the mods and try to do them properly and try and find a way to see if they actually work and you've done it right. Because otherwise you can go ahead and say, okay, I did that, but it doesn't work. That's a piece of shit. And then you get that back and forth thing that usually happens on forums. Oh, I'm so tired of that. <laughs> Somebody says this works, then another guy comes along and says, okay, this doesn't work, and then you get, you know, a ton of crap. Well, they've um, largely not, not been properly tested or not, not, not thought about. It's just people's best guess. Yeah, somebody thought, okay, this is going, this is a good idea, and he designs something, and he puts it on, and it makes a difference, and he designs something else, adds it to the existing thing, and... I've seen nano talents that look like Frankenstein. They've got so many mods on them. It doesn't look like a plane anymore. It's ridiculous. 
Mm. And the mm. thing is, it all depends on how you want to use this thing. I don't want to fl fly close to the ground. I don't want to do pro proximity flying. I want to chase clouds. And chasing clouds involves going high. <laughs> and when you go high, there are pockets of turbulence, there are thermals, etc., etc. But when you go high, predominantly there are, uh, I'm not sure of, if the word is right, laminar winds. Yeah, smoother. And, yeah. Yeah, smooth. Things are smooth up there. I've been I've been high. And honestly, you you look at that screen and at some point I get shivers through me and I think, oh my god, the picture is frozen. I don't have FPV. And then I shake the stick and I actually see it moving. Otherwise, it just doesn't move because you're so high, nothing on the ground changes that quickly. And at some point you get that feeling that you you're looking at a steel image, not a moving airplane so it all depends on how you want to use it but he's yeah. right when, when when you when you apply something like that you definitely need to make sure it's done properly to get the effect you're looking for otherwise yeah. it's just another piece of plastic on a model that's not up to your expectations and it doesn't really help much if it's not done right absolutely do you simulate uh, weather at all, Walter, or is it just uh, just perfect conditions? Well, it, it's a mix. So, so when I talked about the time I spent at the design and engineering agency, there every simulation was custom, right? It's, it, whether we were doing a NASCAR or Formula Three or Four, um, we had a different setup, different uh, bounding box, different domain size. Um, with AirShaper, we wanted to make things accessible, and to make things accessible. You need to make assumptions. You need to fix at least some set of parameters, right? For example, if we would ask every time, what's the turbulence intensity of your flow uh, ahead of the of the drone, for example? Um, what's the altitude? What's the density? What's the temperature? We could do this, but then again, we're writing a conventional uh, software package where we just allow engineers to input everything. And, and then we've missed our goal of making aerodynamics accessible to anyone. Um, so with our automated tool, uh, we set these things to a fixed value, or at least uh, we provide a formula behind the scenes that operates in the same way every time. Um, so no, the user cannot set it, because then again, we would be developing a high-end tool. On the other hand, if, if advanced simulations are required, we can do custom projects where we can vary the turbulence intensity, for example, or, or, or look at laminar versus uh, turbulent flow behavior, uh, things like that. Um, so yes, it's possible, but if you want to make it accessible, then, then you have to automate at least some parts of it. That's the compromise. So if I come to you with the design, you can, you can sort of give me, through looking at a website, three options of, of what I, I can get. So I've got, I've got, I assume I've got a design in some sort of 3D format and an idea of how heavy it's going to be. Um, what's, what's it going to, well, if, if you don't mind, mind me asking, what's it going to cost to have a, a simulation drawn on it and how might those three tiers work? Yeah. So basically the output that you get, sorry, is a, a full PDF. I don't know if you've seen it. You can download the sample report on our website. Um, it contains the force values and X, Y, Z for both the pressure and the, and, and the viscous forces. And it will give you a, a set of different visualizations uh, to see where drag is coming from, for example, to see what surface streamlines are behaving like. If, if everything is behaving nicely in 2D, like most, most setups are designed, or if you have some kind of 3D uh, flow patterns um, on, on your wings. Um, and the difference between the three setups that you mentioned is basically the accuracy. So the report structure is all the same, but the accuracy is different. It means that we apply more cells. You can compare it to the resolution of a, of, a, of a camera, for example. We just increase the resolution of the simulation uh, to capture smaller details and smaller vortex structure and turbulences uh, that may exist in the flow. Um, so basically, like, like mentioned before, if, you, if you're at the early design phase, you don't need as much resolution. Whereas if you're fine tuning the position of your antenna or the size of the antenna, for example, then you may need a detailed, a detailed or an ultimate simulation. And then am I paying per run of the simulation to yes. have the different yes. levels? I'm just looking at the website. I see it starts at um, 200 euros. It's what, 242, including VAT. 
to 605 euros for your second tier and then your final yeah. phase one is is one eight to 15 and that's all to be found at airshaper.com uh, airshaper.com um so and that's that's aerodynamics on anything uh, from a brick to a to an aircraft anything we want to know whether it's going to work in in whatever way yes yes probably can make bricks fly if you, if you modify them a little bit um but it's true we do we do solar panels we do wind flow patterns uh, around buildings uh we do small city vehicles so yes basically anything that you would put in a wind tunnel we put it in our virtual wind tunnel that's the essence Wow, this is quite a. Well, this is going to be a rude. I'm king of rude questions. Are there many businesses like yours out there? Yes, there are. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> we, we 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 did check them before we started with Airshaper. Uh, the thing is, um, you have other platforms, also online platforms, um, but they are oriented um, at engineers. If you do a simulation in the cloud, for example. Um, running an, a virtual wind tunnel like we do, they will ask you, for example, what solver do you want to use? Uh, what's the domain size you want to apply? And, and, and to someone experienced in simulations, this, this, this is well not trivial, but it's known to them. And they know, more importantly, what the impact on accuracy is if they start tweaking these parameters. Uh, but that's the difference with Airshaper. We, we automate this and, and we take away some freedom uh, so that we are sure every simulation is done right. And that's the difference. We aim at a larger group of designers and hobbyists um, that are able to do aerodynamics now uh, without having to be an expert uh, in simulations. Wow, that's fantastic. So that's at airshaper.com, dear viewer, if you wish to see it. We'd better move on, but please stay with us and jump in. And you're going to the commercial UAV show in, uh, in the UK this week, I believe. Yes, tomorrow morning I take the Eurostar uh, to get to London and then uh, there's a presentation at 12 o'clock, uh, Theatre 3, uh, where we'll discuss drone aerodynamics. Uh, I will talk about fixed wing drone design and then end up with uh, the SenseFly uh, example that we discussed today as well. Fantastic. So everybody's welcome, ask personal questions there. <laughs> well, we're gonna, yeah, we're going to have a man on the ground there. Michael Smith will be on the ground, sneaking around uh, with his camera. So he might pop in and see you. Um, okay, fantastic. So that, that, that'll be great. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. Um, just very quickly, I know one of, just of interest, and this will nicely link into Richard, maybe, as that the uh, Department of Transport in America has decided to audit the FAA uh, as to how they're cracking on with the integration of uh, small unmanned aircraft systems and with special um, special mention of uh, their Lance system or LANC as it should be called. Um, and I think that is something that that you have uh, have you uh, have you started using that yet, um, Richard? And Richard is from Altitude Angel, uh, a UK a UTM, I guess. Well, actually, did I say that? Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't describe yourself as that. You've described us as worse, so I think I think we'll settle with that for now. Thank you, Gary. Um, but yeah, we're a we're a long certified provider, long lance, however you want to call it. Oh, come on, L A N L A N C. It's lank. It's not lance. It's, where's the E? It's lank. Come on. Yeah. Um, so you're a provider of that. Is that going well for you? I mean, they say here that there's 300 air traffic facilities providing the service to approximately 500 airports nationwide. And given the significant safety implications associated with integrating U.S. operations throughout the NASA, we're initiating an audit assessing the FAA's role in authorizing small U.S. operations. I mean, has, has, has your service lit up or is, hard, or is nobody using it? So at the moment, we're still in closed beta and we're doing a few things differently to the way lots of other USS, um, lots of Lance certified providers are, are operating. The first is that we have our own API that sits in front of the Lance system. And that kind of is a generic interface um, uh, that interfaces with lots of different backend systems. So for example, if you're an applications developer or a drone manufacturer and you want to uh, you want to provide a nice, easy mechanism for your customers to be able to access controlled airspace. Um, if you want that to happen in the US, you would have to become a USS service provider. If you want that to happen in the UK, you'd also have to interface with NATS. And what we're doing is kind of coming in and inserting a translation layer so that as the application developer or the drone manufacturer, you simply integrate with us. 
and then we'll work out based on where in the world you're requesting to fly what are the appropriate systems that we need to settle uh, and interconnect with and then we standardize that interaction and, and response set so in other words you kind of get you know one throat to choke uh for that specific problem um because lots of countries around the world right now are um are going ahead and, and experimenting and implementing with lots of different systems so as i say right now we're um we're kind of still in a closed beta phase and i think december 5th is the date that we announced for going uh, to making that api generally available on our developer platform as well i'll ask you some more about it in a second but i must jump back as nick i said in the comments is asking walter do you do you do winglet simulations winglets are still kind of a mystery amongst us hobby rc pilots yes yes we do and and when you're looking at a part of a of a, of a drone uh, like a winglet for example you have the choice whether you want to simulate the entire drone and they need more resolution to capture the local behavior of the winglet or if you do a simulation just on the winglet but then you might miss some of the behavior that is impacted by the winglet but yes we do uh, and that was basically uh, the majority of the work that we did on sensefly drone um it, it's really weird how just the winglet improved the entire lift behavior of the drone. Uh, you would think it just impacts the last 20% of the length of the wing, but it's completely untrue. It impacts the, almost the entire width of the wing. Uh, so yes, that's definitely something that we do and, and something that is crucial. Uh, it looks like a detail visually, but it certainly isn't. That's very interesting. Yeah, I would, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's some subject one could probably go on out for, about for a long time, but we'd better not. We'd better not. Let's jump back to uh, Richard again. Uh, now, the UK is about to, and, and we'll bring David in in a minute, because there's also, also be bashing Richard as well. Um, but the UK is about to have quite a big test in a, quite a chunk of controlled airspace. I didn't know I wasn't uh, supposed to. Last Friday, I received an invite. Uh, to go to this thing, and they mentioned, uh, which I can't go to, unfortunately, I'm in South Africa. Uh, I'd love to, but I can't go. Uh, and um, they didn't say I couldn't say anything about it. So we seem to have jumped the gun, and it's good that it's on November the 21st. Uh, much like the uh, Urban Air Vehicles, Urban UAM, Urban Air Mobility guys, uh, that are launching on the 21st as well. Richard, do you know, did they choose the 21st because that's Montgolfier Day, or is that just luck? Uh, that's uh, the combination of lots of different partners selecting the one day that magically worked for everyone, and, and that, that's really that day. <laughs> well, that's the 235th anniversary of the first flight by the Montgolfier brothers in France. I think it's 235. So I said somebody clever will do the math, 1783, November the 21st to now. Um, so that's, that's a happy happenstance. So what, what, what's it all about, and what's Altitude Angels' involvement? Brilliant. Okay. So um, I guess the first thing I'll do is point people to the website. If you're interested in anything I'm saying, then there's a lot more detail you'll find on uh, operationzenith.com. Um, I'm sure we can put the address somewhere later on. Um, but basically, uh, it's, a, it's a presentation by Nats, Altitude Angel, and also uh, Manchester Airport, and a whole bunch of other partners which are all, who are all listed on the website. And the aim behind Operation Zenith really is to imagine what the future airspace may look like in some time frame, 15, 20 years from now, where what we're trying to achieve is, or, or what we're imagining is happening, is that drones are now fully integrated into, into everyday uh, operations. Um, being flown beyond visual line of sight and being flown automated. Um, and what we're trying to do, um, working together, is to show that using today's technologies, so not waiting for anything new to happen, but using the technologies that are available today in airspace constructs and regulatory constructs that we already have today, how you can go ahead and do this stuff safely. So there are a number of um, very impactful things that we're bringing together under one roof. Um, the first thing for us is that unlike a lot of other drone demonstrations, it was key to the Operation Zenith teams that we wanted to be able to conduct the demo in unsegregated airspace. So you can pretty much do whatever you like if you're going to no time the area and create your own uh, snow globe of airspace. Um, but the problem is you can't replicate that over a, over a really interesting landscape over the city or, over, or within an airport. So we said, okay, well, let's do this in 
inside segregate uh, inside non segregated airspace. And the second thing we wanted to do was demonstrate actually being able to integrate with everyday commercial air traffic operations. So it kind of became clear that if we wanted to put those two things together, what we really needed was a big, busy international airport. Um, and we were very lucky to have some very forward looking folks at Manchester Airport who said, come and do this at our airport. Um, and then the other thing we wanted to do as a UTM provider um, is, is also start to, to really add some intelligence to the UTM system and provide interconnections into that system for a whole bunch of stakeholders. So very, um, very simply, um, in Operation Zenith, we'll be demonstrating what we call cooperative drone traffic. So that's drone manufacturers or drone pilots who are using our apps or have integrated direct send telemetry into Altitude Angels UTM. Um, but of course, if you're at an airport, one of the big things you're actually concerned about is folks who are there who aren't cooperating and perhaps they're there illegally or they're, you know, just, just ignorant of the rules. Um, so we've had to also factor into the UTM system how we'll interconnect with the various drone detection systems that exist today. And we're very lucky to have uh, DJI on board as a partner, as well as D-Drone and Vodafone, who are all doing um, various uh, various uh, projects to develop products that will actually add a kind of drone detection solution. And what the UTM does in all of this is it, it aggregates all of this information together to work out actually who is where they should be and who is potentially a risk. And the final piece we've done is to integrate all of this into the UTM platform and all of the existing ATM systems and networks that exist today. So very simply, um, we've integrated with the radar at Manchester Airport so that we can see aircraft in the vicinity. We've also done uh, an integration with UAvionics so that we're not only able to receive ADSB, but we're able to broadcast ADSB back out, um, which we will do in a number of situations when we're detecting uh, air traffic in on our network of drones that um, is uncooperative. So there's a whole situation awareness piece which is coming together. A whole, so many people involved actually, so many partners, over 150 people. I think there's something like 17, 18 countries, companies around the world coming together to demonstrate what the what tomorrow's skies will effectively look like today. And you've got you've got several scenarios, haven't you? You've got um, uh, like a railway inspection, a BV loss flight. Uh, you you, are, you can unpack them better than me. Yeah. So I guess in, in a nutshell, what we wanted to do, as I say, if you if you cast your mind forwards to that futuristic point, you pick the time frame, as I say, 15, 20 years, and you were to take a slice right through the airspace and you were having a look at everything that's going on. What we wanted to do is create a bunch of very realistic scenarios that are very representative of those types of operations that, that might be occurring. So we've actually got um, an on airfield delivery. Um, so this is effectively a drone which is operating on the airfield um, flying BV loss that's doing a parts delivery from one section of the airfield to another. We've got a threshold inspection on the runway, which effectively um, I think is known as a pavement inspection, where you've got a drone that's going to fly up the, the runway, uh, taking high resolution images. We've also got a linear infrastructure inspection occurring um, uh, over network rails infrastructure, which appears just inside the, the control zone of Manchester Airport. That's being conducted by a very large fixed wing drone. We then also got a mixture of VLOS visual line of sight operations taking place as well, because we don't anticipate that those will go away in the future. Um, that's going to be an atmospheric survey. So it's a, I think that's being run by Manchester University. And those guys are essentially flying a drone very high into, into the atmosphere to, to sense what's going on. We've got a bunch of commercial visual line of sight operations, a site survey, a survey that's going on visual line of sight as well. And then we've got a safeguarding scenario, which of course is very important if you're operating in an airport. That's being able to detect rogue entrance into that airspace from a from a drone perspective and then have the UTM inform all of the, the drones that are under its control, all of the pilots nearby that there's a risk, as well as collaborate and communicate with the ATM environment as well. And then finally, um, because I think no UTM's demo is complete without uh, the, uh, the closure of an airspace, we're also gonna have um, uh, the National Police Air Service come along um, who have very, very kindly agreed to, uh, to help us out. And they're gonna uh, essentially stage a missing person uh, search where they're going to be using a drone uh, provided by Greater Manchester Police. When the person is found, they're going to call in the MPAS helicopter. And on that event occurring, 
the UTM system will execute certain actions to ensure that the helicopter pilots have the visibility of the situation on the ground, but also other uh, drone pilots operating in the vicinity are asked to get out of the airspace to clear the area for the helicopter to land. This is all top-notch sounding stuff, and this is the point where I normally argue uh, with you about various things, because it's my job in life, is to argue with you, but I found someone that's even more commercially than me, um, and that's that's David, who's an air traffic controller and an unmanned aircraft uh, safety expert, actually, um, and all, all joking aside, he, he knows his stuff, uh, he knows his air traffic stuff, uh, but the judge in the, uh, or a safety guy in the uh, Outback Challenge, and uh, well, uh, David, I mean, I'm sure you've got lots of thoughts and things you can throw uh, to this subject. Can you can you chuck some comments into Richard for me? Yeah, sure. Actually, first of all, I, I just need to check if you can hear me because I had to swap the uh, rooms. Yeah, it's all good. Okay. It's all good. Richard, when are you going to tell the CAA? So the CAA are actually on it's our... Just our joke, it's just a joke, by the way. So, uh, I'm just, I'm just yeah, told you. Told you so. <laughs> Gary's not right. Yeah, okay, no, please, please. Well, let's take it as a good question then. So the CAA are on your side? Yeah, absolutely. They've been on board from, from day one. Right. Uh, and, and the safety work? I mean, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, uh, and just my background, air traffic control for 35 years around the world, um, a lot of safety work in Australia. Uh, was the person who assessed uh, all applications for a while there for flight in controlled airspace for unmanned aircraft. Um, and as Gary uh, says, you know, I do a lot of work now with the with unmanned aircraft and and starting to focus more on UTM. Uh, it sounds like an incredibly exciting event. Uh, it had a lot tied into it. Uh, I guess my first questions really are on the safety side of things. How has that progressed and, and how confident are you that it will be as safe as you can possibly make it? Sure. Well, I think um, safety is paramount in any aviation display. Um, certainly when you're involving unmanned traffic and you're looking at automating certain situations, um, then everything becomes even more sensitive. So the work for Zenith started over 10 months ago um with you know very very simple ideas and then there are multiple safety cases that are built around that so certainly here in the uk we have this concept of an operational safety case um we have commercial uh, uav certifications for drone pilots each drone pilot has a safety case um there is an operational theater safety case if you like for the whole event which i, I believe we're we're actually hoping to make public at the end of, uh, of operations and so people can see how we've achieved what we've achieved within the regulatory constraints that are already existing um and then of course with the um, one of our key partners is nats who have uh the air traffic control uh service effectively at manchester airport um and their responsibility is to also provide an additional safety oversight function so um I, I would certainly say safety is something which has uh, has never been a second thought it's it's driven everything that we do and of course um it's all very nice having having everything written down and everything certified and rubber stamped but until you've gone out and done this stuff you don't actually know that if you can actually do the things you're saying that you can all do so we actually have had rehearsals already which we've conducted earlier this month um, they went um, as well as anyone could expect. There are a few operational uh, challenges to, um, that we had to work through, but actually that's because we're operating in non-segregated airspace. We're operating in a live theater. Um, so for example, you know, just because your script says, hey, the National Police Air Service should have turned up right now and they've been called away on a job, you know, you have to, you have to somehow continue your, your scenario. So, the, the purpose behind this really was to make sure that the UTM itself can adapt to an evolving situation. It isn't programmed to follow a rule book. It's programmed with a set of scenarios and conditions that it understands, and it can operate in accordance with those conditions described in the safety case. Right, right. And, and who has that final say of go or no go? You know, for example, on the day you have unusual weather or yeah. a peak in traffic they're not expecting, so, someone has that decision. Who is that? Yeah. So again, what what is perhaps um, not so clear on the website is that actually the the operational theatre isn't just the airfield, um, but most of the areas where we're flying are within the CTR. 
So actually Manchester Airport has the, the final say on whether something goes or doesn't go. And this is actually a key part of the, the UTM demo for us as the UTM provider um, through one of our partners, uh, Frequentis, um, we've actually integrated ourselves directly into the tower so that there is a smart strip system sat there where um, the, uh, the air traffic controller effectively um, can see everything that's happening in the operational theater, both on the ATM side and the UTM. And before we queue up a particular scenario, there's effectively a quadruple check-in from various different partners, including the team in Altitude Angel, just to verify that we're ready to go. Um, so again, because you're operating in an airfield and because you're operating in a in non-segregated airspace, these are the checks that are required, um, particularly when you're out to prove a new technology to pr and to prove a new concept of operations. Yeah, that's uh, it's fascinating. I mean, it's obviously not the time to muck it up. Um, and, and you mentioned a couple of times before that, that well, I, that I took it that it's an information service more than a, a direct control service. So if something goes wrong, um, you have someone has overarching control they can put everything on the ground straight away uh, is there a process for that yeah so the i mean the law in the uk is very clear the human pilot in charge has overall authority on on his or her flight um, and that includes all the safety aspects now what we've had to do within zenith is to try and cater for various different control mechanisms um, BV loss flights are a key part of the future, right? That's what we all want to get to. And actually, we, we're trying to move to a future where you can have automated beyond visual line of sight. Um, and the technology within the UTM is built such that we can provide a command service, which is our, you know, it, it's our internal terminology effectively for the ability to actually reach out and instruct a drone to go to a particular coordinate or to switch to a flight mode like loiter or land or return to base. Um, and then we've also got to cater for pilots who are still cooperating with us, but actually don't have a direct control link with us. And they want an information service. You know, they want to know that the NPAS chopper is coming in and it's going to be there in 30 seconds or 50 seconds, or whatever that's going to be. Um, they also need to know when there's been an airspace closure. So within the UTM, this capability exists to do all of those different control and information mechanisms. And within Zenith, we're demonstrating all of those different control mechanisms. And actually, this is a good example of where that discussion with the CAA and the safety case um, evolution comes in, because actually what it turns out you want to do, obviously, is give the human pilot this. There is still a human in the loop when this is not something we're hiding. Although the drone itself is flying its mission um, in an automated fashion, there's still a human in the loop. When our UTM wants to reach out and execute an instruction, it's going to prompt the user to do that instruction. Now that pilot can still override. And even when it's executing that instruction, the pilot can still override. Um, so we have that, that facility. Built into the UTM itself is what we call effectively the red button scenario. The red button scenario is a, is, a, is a backup channel of communications we have with each of the operators and each of the drones to be able to affect our contingency plan should something not be going according to plan. Um, and there are obviously there's so many different vehicles involved. They all do different things. They all go to predefined uh, safe locations, etc. So there's a whole there's a whole bunch of thought that's gone into that. But um, you know, one of the key things we want to do within Zenith is show people what is possible. What we're not here to do is say this is how you must do it. This is how you must deploy it. The concept of operations will vary in different locations in different countries. Um, but the, as we know, you know, the, the technology is there definitely to have a remote system reach out and tell a drone where to go, for example. Example. But but doing that safely is incredibly hard. Um, it's not simply a case of just randomly picking a coordinate and asking the drone to go there. So we are, you know, a significant part of this demo is our deconfliction service, which is obviously running strategic deconfliction, um, but is running tactical deconfliction um, on not just the uh, the drones, but also fully aware of aircraft visible to Manchester radar. Can you just unpack the, the two different sorts of deconfliction there for me, please? Yeah, of course. So strategic deconfliction for us is when we are receiving flight plans in advance from our drone pilots and they're telling us where they want to go. Um, and of course, you know, just a very simple example of strategic deconfliction would be both Gary and I want to fly in exactly the same place at exactly the same time. So the UTM system will say, hey, that's probably a really bad idea, guys. You're both operating in the same area. So that's a really rough course example of strategic deconfliction. Tactical deconfliction, on the other hand, is monitoring everything in the airspace as it happens and then providing um, avoidance instructions, whether they are navigational alterations or they are messages um, intended for a human to read, 
to try and manage that conflict. So, you know, that is very, very, very crudely a lot like the job of an air traffic controller, right? To keep every, make sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing. But in the event that something goes wrong, to try and manage that situation. And what we're trying to create within Zenith is, is a very busy operational theater where actually there would be many drones, many different things going, uh, going on at low altitude, at high speed. So you actually need to have a degree of automation in that uh, operation to be able to, to deconflict that airspace and put everything back so that it's no longer in conflict with each other. Um, so that's broadly the two types of um, deconfliction that we have. But of course, the, the one that's most important, that's running most of the time uh, throughout the demo, is the essentially automated um, deconfliction service, which will actually react. Because it, because it is deployed live within the CTR, we can't control everything in there, right? I mean, hopefully Manchester are on that case, the ATC guys. Um, but you know, if someone chooses to fly a drone in that airspace anywhere at the time, the UTM will react to that. Are they going to route traffic uh, differently through the CTR where they're doing it? Or if, if I come along in my uh, 152, can I drive through as I normally would? Or, or will there be subtle changes with general aviation? No. So uh, there will be a navigation warning on the day, uh, but there'll be no changes to the normal procedures at Manchester Airport. And actually, I have to credit credit where it's due. Every partner has worked incredibly hard. Manchester Airport have been particularly supportive because they recognize the commercial value to, to drone operators and to the industry at large. So they've they've done what, uh, an amazing job to integrate us within the normal flight schedules at Manchester Airport um, on November 21st. It's, it's incredible. And actually during the rehearsals, my, my favorite video clip that I've got, probably shouldn't say this, uh, my favorite video <laughs> clip is um, watching the drone um, go and do its uh, threshold, uh, sorry, go and do its parts delivery from one end of the airfield to the other. And there was a, a TUI Airlines uh, aircraft that had just landed that was asked to hold on the taxiway while our drone crossed. Um, and then the aircraft continued. So, you know, it's been given a very high status within the airfield as well. I did notice Manchester tweeted a still image of that, I believe. Uh, I wondered, I wondered, yeah, well, anyway, but they didn't say that's what was happening, but there was a still image of a runway inspection. I thought, gosh, Manchester are very progressive, and now you've joined the dots for me. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> I understand now. I see where that came from. So it, what do I want to say? I want to say that... Uh, well, re recently um, in, in Tanzania with David, and David's just down the road. He's in, he's in Winchester, so I think he should motor up and come yeah, and see that on the two of us. He can come and have my you can have my invite. Just go as me. Just just grow the rest of that you've got going on there, David. Um, but uh, I, what I thought, what sort of surprised me when I watched kind of a UTM demonstration was how disconnected the operator actually was from, from what was going on and the air picture around them as as an operator there i am doing my thing i've put a flight plan into altitude angel uh, what am i told as i'm flying my rpas and am i told stuff beforehand or only whilst i'm operating um, i guess it kind of depends on how you're integrated and what you're flying so, for example, if you're an operator, we have um, uh, an operational partner called Callan Lens, um, uh, quite a big company in the UK, very well established doing BV loss operations on, on quite big airframes. Um, Callan Lens have actually integrated a direct telemetry connection from their ground control station into the Altitude Angel UTM. So the, the kind of interactions that they get you know, pre-flight and during flight are very different to if you are a recreational pilot who's just, you know, popping up your Guardian mobile phone application and then asking for permission to fly. Um, of course, what's, what's powering a lot of this as well is a kind of geospatial rules engine that we've got going in the background, which we'll be talking about in the, um, in the, in the presentation at the Royal Aeronautical Society, which is our tooling for allowing an airspace operator like Manchester, for example, to be able to define regions where they can kind of automatically approve or automatically reject requests to fly in those areas, depending on certain criteria, or they can choose to have them be routed directly to a console in the ATC. So they could, for example, have that appear as a flight strip 
or as a console, uh, some other system that's standards compliant that interfaces with ours. Um, so that whole interaction process will either be machine to machine, um, in which case the GCS manufacturer kind of takes a little bit more responsibility for interpreting the information messages that Altered Angel is giving, or it will be designed uh, to, to talk to a human. So in, for example, in an emergency situation where we're doing an airspace closer scenario, if you're flying the Canon Lens vehicle, you'll be instructed to land and that GCS command will flow through and your aircraft will go ahead and do that. Um, if you are a human and you are flying recreationally, you will get a, a pop-up notification in the app. And if we detect that the app hasn't received that pop-up notification, we will text you as well. <laughs> we will send that out via SMS. And of course, you get a human readable message at that point instructing you um, that the service you've selected, in which case this is the information service, is advising that you now land because it's about to become a very dangerous place for you to be. I guess I suppose what I, I was thinking, and David, just just jumping, David's right, jumping there if I'm saying anything, you know, too offensive now, which I'm likely to do. But that, I guess I think what I thought I would have liked as an operator was a little like preamble briefing because I'm expecting to fly this. In this case, the scenario was delivery drones and a 40 minute or 20 minute flight. I can't remember what it was now across to an island. But I think I would have liked to have seen uh, or, or had some sort of briefing that said at the, the airfield that was literally just behind us, could see the windsock from where we were. Um, they're expecting uh, the five departures in the next hour and two arrivals from the north or whatever so that as my flight progressed i guess I'm, I'm i might be having too old-fashioned a way of thinking perhaps but i would have liked to have had a good idea of what i might expect as it's coming along and then then be able to jump in and react as required but yeah and now i'm talking about out and allowed maybe it's just an old-fashioned way of thinking so i think you know <laughs> One of the challenges, constant challenge actually, for all of the Operations Zenith partners was to try and keep focused on that future airspace. So actually, if you go forward 10 or 15 years time, then that concept of trying to tell someone up front, kind of like a pre-flight briefing of all the activity within, for example, the CTR, which is a big area, um, would actually get really difficult. And you'd probably never be able to interpret that much information. So it becomes about separation of concerns and more around understanding when is the appropriate time to, to, to sort of penetrate those two boundaries and connect people with that information. So actually a lot of that, that um, checking who is going to be where and when is done at pre-flight, but it's just done automa you know, automatically. Um, and the UTM won't allow you to, to set up a flight path, or if you're flying VLOS, to do a v what we call a VLOS cylinder, which is 500 meters from your takeoff location in any, any location and any orientation rather, um, it won't allow those things to occur if it knows they're going to have a conflict in time and location with something else. Um, so that's a very simple pass that we do just to check. And that does include air, um, air traffic movements. Um, but okay, of course, the, the one thing that is um, very important, particularly operating in the CTR, is, is that tactical picture. It is the recreational user who just pops up you know, flies their DJI Phantom 4 or whatever it's going to be a mile from the airfield and, and causes a, a scare. And that's why we have the, the, the non-cooperative drone detection systems in place so that UTM can then sense this, work out who that actually is. Um, and if we don't know who that is, we know that we have a risk that we've got to manage. Um, and that's when we start disseminating information and providing real-time situation awareness to everyone that's now potentially in conflict. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of technology which is actually not on the operations on site but will be available straight after the event where we're showing all of the, the visual products that we've created that provide that con constant awareness to people participating in that area. Well, I'd be right in saying this is possibly the largest li proper live big <laughs> whatever UTM trial that there's been to date. Um, well, we are British, right? So we're always apologetic. So we'll start off by saying, you know, we're absolutely 100% confident this is the largest demonstration in UK airspace. Um, it's certainly, from our perspective on the technology side, we think it's the most comprehensive UTM demonstration ever undertaken. Um, we also think it, you know, if you tick that box, you can probably tick it's also the most integrated demonstration ever taken. And there's a whole bunch of other things we think are, are, um, are firsts. But actually, what we're most interested in is that future looking capability and then the ability to say, right, well, we don't have to wait for the future now. What we want is to be able to give other ANSPs and other regulators a, a bit of a blueprint 
so that they can understand that actually we have sufficient flexibility within a lot of these regulations today. And we have also a mechanism for rolling um, UTM technologies out. It's called controlled airspace. Um, it's already a very useful construct. So perhaps that's the solution that we, we should be looking at. So again, yeah. you know, as a technology company, you know, we're, we're providing the what we call our uh, airspace management operating system over to, to Nats, who have that operational control to deploy it and then to run it. Um, well, I, 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 I had a bit of a, you know, of course, obvious moment. It's just a controlled airspace. I don't know if you saw the, I uh, can't remember which light aircraft group it is that shows concentration of tracks within the UK. And of course, everything is skirting around all the controlled airspace. When I used to live in the balloon world, uh, I used to fly in Luton uh, and Stansted CTR because I had a Modest transponder. No other balloons did. No other balloons had ever landed in there. Uh, because they stayed out of it. So I had a whole area uh, within controlled airspace that the farmers didn't mind us at all. <laughs> and used to have a fantastic relationship with Luton. And so when you when you look at that, it's exactly the same. So where people want stuff delivered, other than the pop-up traffic, which is your quote unquote uncooperative or rogue drone, you, the actual airspace element of it is is uh, you you like aircraft don't go there, you know, and the uh, airliners only go down up and down the roads to the big airfields. Um, so yeah, I, it, it was a bit of a eureka that's obvious moment to me. So how how will we watch this on the twenty first uh, when we're overseas, like what I am? Well, um, it's one of those things where you kind of have to be in it to, to witness it. So actually what we're doing is, and this is such a massive operation, we've got two outside broadcasting units um, providing satellite downlink, um, and we've got a closed audience at the Royal Aeronautical Society in London who we're going to demonstrate this with first. Um, they're going to be the first people in the world to witness it uh, live. Um, uh, there will also be a QA and a and a panel session and the obligatory networking uh, event that goes with it. But actually, then our broadcasting company are going to take all of the footage from the day, um, from all of the different cameras, all of the ground stations, um, all of the aircraft that are involved as well, and then put that together into a package that people can then watch um, on demand after the event. So we're hopeful that that will happen in the, in, the, in a few days following the event. Um, but as soon as that happens, then, then the whole nature of the Operations Zenith site will, will change, the operationszenith.com. It will change to show each of the scenarios filmed and the videos that go with them as well as a few surprises that i haven't told you about today um as well as we'll drill much more into the technology that, that's empowered a lot of this um again a key a key focus on this beyond safety is that utm only happens with collaboration and cooperation it's not about competition and um, when we show you guys the credit slides for how many people are actually involved in this making making this work you know, what we're also showing as a kind of sub message is it takes all of these people to come together and agree to do something to make this thing happen. So there's a lot of stuff that you'll be able to do to get involved post uh, post operations Zenith, um, but actually kind of getting to a live stream was something that we felt was probably an operational step that was a little bit would have required more film directors, more unit directors, etc. And it makes sense for us to be able to provide a better experience to people who aren't there um, on demand. That's a top answer. You always could, when, you, when you're entering politics, that was a top answer. David, I think you were going to jump in there. Have you got something else to yeah, say? Yeah, a couple of quick things. I don't know how much time we've got. Maybe give me an indication there. Um, as much time as you like. All the time. Thanks. All the right. time. All the yes. time. Here we are. Well, well, right. well, in which case, so I won't bore you with too many questions, but just the first point is I shared on the uh, the group chat there, and, and listeners okay. won't hear that. But uh, So a month ago, uh, the 13th Air Navigation Conference, that ICAO occurred in Montreal. And uh, Agenda Item 5 had, uh, and you can watch all this on video, you know, there's six or seven sessions, uh, was on emerging issues. So operations in high level altitude with drones, operations in low airspace. Uh, they start off with a thousand feet, but those, those low airspace. And then operations for RPAS, so RPAS in controlled airspace. And, and this is the draft recommendation from the report that ICAO developed through an appropriate group of experts standards and recommended practices, guidance, or best practices relating to UTM autonomous operations after states and regions have had sufficient time to test and validate UTM concepts. Now, if you've been following the history of ICAO and, and their scope has been international IFR when it comes to remotely piloted aircraft systems, this is an enormous 
uh, change in direction in my mind. Uh, there is a small group with an IK, the UASAG, who look at this. Well, they're not a small group, but they're an important group. But this is, the, this is really defined now that this is what's going to happen. And within a month, uh, Zenith is doing just that. So, you know, to be honest, it, it's very timely, in, in my opinion. Um, the Drone Innovators Network uh, inaugural event in Zurich, Switzerland, in I think June, late June, I attended that. Uh, be careful about your figures. I think you're probably right. That's one of the biggest ones in the world. They certainly had a large number of, of BV, BV loss flight, other drones in the airspace, a full UTM, AMAC cameras, uh, a big event as well. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. It's, it's very exciting. Um, I guess I have to question, and I'm tripping anyone up, it just intrigues me, the surveillance, uh, you know, typically with, with air traffic management surveillance, we have reliability, you know, seven or eight items that are required, I can go through the list if you want, um, to get accurate uh, real-time surveillance of an aircraft that we then use as part of our uh, target levels of safety, um, to separate, provide separation minimum between pairs of aircraft. So, so the surveillance you're using, for example, the BV loss flight, uh, that must have some accuracy of surveillance for the aircraft's positioning. So it's geodetic, GNSS, whatever positioning, and then also how you get that information to where you are and how you know it's real time. How do you then compare that reliability with the reliability of the air traffic management surveillance, which I'm assuming is MODIS radar at Manchester. I've never looked at Manchester control zone. Um, and then also how close are you going to come to those uh, conventional aircraft? So two questions, the reliability of the data, uh, of the surveillance, and also how close are you, will you, in real life, will you be between your BV loss flight and conventional aircraft? Great. Okay, so really, really good questions. Um, I'm, I, it's a shame I can't show you this slide. I have a slide that would explain to you all of the sources that we use. Post Zenith, this will not be a problem. I'll try and talk to that from memory, but effectively, um, UTM system isn't reliant upon any single source of position information. This was the first um, first target for us, um, which actually presents more problems than just uh, kind of reliability. You have a correlation issue. Um, for example, if we have a cooperative drone who's sending us telemetry via LTE and is sending us GPS position information accurate to say half a meter, that's great. Um, but if we can also see the same, you know, logically the same vehicle on a drone detection system, which may or may not share that same reliability, or as it passes through that detection region, varies its um its accuracy this creates a correlation issue and actually there's not one source as i said there's there's multiple sources of that information um on the kind of um i guess the standards uh, question you know re re resilience and reliability you know as a, as a technology company we're taking all of the steps that we feel are necessary in order to provide a, a service with a known sla and a known availability and known set of performance criteria the challenge has been understanding what are the appropriate aviation standards that we need to apply to that technology solution? And actually, this is one of the drums we've been banging for the last four and a half years with regulators around the world is saying, okay, well, we think these are appropriate, but there's actually nothing that requires us to do this, but here's what we're trying to do. Shouldn't, shouldn't we be pushing for something that approaches what you do in the aviation world today? Um, so I won't profess at all to say that the UTM system is built to the same um, well, to any particular standard that is applies to uh, the ATM world today, um, what we're pushing for is a set of standards which should apply to UTM systems before you're able to provide those capabilities. To help mitigate that, what we have obviously done is work very extensively with NATS um, and Manchester Airport to test and to describe and to document not just how the system works, but how we've built it. Um, and one of the very first things we did at Altitude Angel was decide not to use anything off the shelf. Um, and the whole reason for doing that, even though it's very expensive and very painful to build everything from the ground up, is because we want certification. And actually, the only way you're going to get certified to do these types of operations is if you can explain everything that happens from, you know, from the first thing, uh, the first byte in your system to the last byte as it, as it leaves. And if you've got a black box in there, that the regulator can't see, you're never going to do that. So, you know, we, we've taken a very fastidious approach to making sure that we, you know, we're able to provide instrumentation around um, all of the telemetry we receive, the rate at which we are receiving it, 
um, the period at which um, latency starts to come in um, and how the, you know, the UTM actually uses latency as a core factor in its decision making. Um, so there's lots of things that have gone into Zenith which won't be immediately apparent. But again, that's part of the goal is to make it look seamless. What we're hoping we can do is get permission to share that operational safety case that, that covers it as well, because we'll go into a lot of those questions. You can imagine one of the very first questions from the CAA is how do you prove it safe enough? And that is a huge question. There are so many elements of that beyond the technical as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, that, that's good. I mean, I wrote the uh, the operations manual for the Lake Victoria Challenge and the application letter to the authorities in Tanzania. Uh, and, and I went through that uh, to, to, to make a document that was appropriate and would fit to every scenario. So it's not just for Tanzania. It certainly matches areas where there's no surveillance and there's no uh, air traffic management surveillance at present in Tanzania. Uh, and a lot of that would, uh, would work well with what you're doing. My immediate questions or concerns, and I'm not, they're not questions you need to answer, but you know, the first thing I'd be worried about is the wake turbulence. The, I did a paper for the International Conference of UAS in uh, Denver 2015 on weight turbulence and light unmanned aircraft latency. There's a whole range of issues. Um, and we don't have separation standards for weight turbulence and light aircraft or drones. We also, I mean, there would, would be a concern of mine that uh, an ACAS TCAS event, if you had a flyaway, could you cause a, an aircraft on final or on departure to have an ACAS event? Um, those are those are concerns and I'm sure you've gone through all of them uh, I guess the really what I want to say is that that you're looking at down the path and I personally this is just my own opinion I don't believe that the airspace cat uh, categorization system we have now uh, from a KO is going to work that that in 10 years down the path we'll say well actually we're just trying to put a push a, a round peg through a square hole Let's give up on this and let's come up with airspace category U or whatever it's going to be. And I like the idea that you're pushing the, the envelope to be in non-segregated airspace. I just don't know that this is the end state yet. I know a lot of people are saying it's the end state, but and maybe I'm one of the few controversial ones that are not, but I don't believe it is. I think you raise a really valid point, and, and this is part of the reason that we exist as a company is to provide technical solutions that will cater for whatever policies or constructs will, will unfold. The challenge is, is unfolding in, in real time. It's happening now. So people are doing things today and they need to make sure that what they're integrating with is still going to work in, you know, two years, three years, five years, 50 years. Um, and as our, you know, we see our role in this and making sure that that transition from policy A to policy B is transparent for the airspace users on both sides of the equation, whether it's on the drone side, the unmanned aircraft side, or the ATM side. Um, so I actually agree with you. Um, the UTM system that, that, that we happen to have engineered doesn't make any assumptions around how you've carved that airspace up. It's designed to be incredibly configurable. Um, and one of the other uh, interesting aspects that, that we imagine as part of the future is that it's probably not just one or, may, or maybe two entities that are responsible for the management and the, and the description of those airspace volumes and rules. And we've, we've built that UTM system so that a central authority can sub, uh, kind of sub-delegate authority to known entities. And the, the classic use case for this are folks like, um, let's say, Network Rao, one of our partners. You know, they have thousands of miles of linear track infrastructure in the UK. There are similar network routes all over the world. And it's very likely that um, they're going to see an increase in the number of drone operators working for them, flying over their infrastructure. So they're going to need some ability to describe what their infrastructure looks like from an airspace perspective, and also to be able to control or even uh, certainly in the early phases, have visibility over airport, uh, air operations are around them. So the UTM has to be designed to support multiple stakeholders designing the airspace, multiple stakeholders using the airspace, and then an evolving set of rules and policies, which aren't known now. That's, the, that's a huge design challenge for us. Um, but, I, but I absolutely agree with you. you know, wherever you look at the moment, uh, it seems almost Every standards body, even in the UK, you have the British Standards Institute now looking into U UTM, you have ICAO, you have the EU looking at it. Um, everyone wants to have their say. And the point is the dust will settle at some point 
And you can almost make a case for the fact that it's not going to be unified a, a, across the world. Um, there will always be the, we have a, we implement this standard, but we do this thing different. Um, and that's where we, we see um, the devil in the detail, but you know, that could potentially stop a UTM system operating. So we've built it so that you, you can have that flexibility. All right, that, that's a great statement. I really like what you're saying there. I mean, we will, we absolutely know that there is no interoperability, no standardization right now between uh, the way drones are treated around the world. I run a website called droneregulations.info. This is sort of one of, one of my voluntary roles, and it lists all the different regulations uh, as accurately as we can as volunteers of countries around the world. And you can only imagine how different we all yeah. are. Uh, and UGM is the same. I mean, already the, the horse is bolted um, and we, we guarantee North America and the rest of the world will have different ways of approaching things. Historically, that's how ATM goes. And, and there's lots of good things come of that. Uh, yeah. But I guess <laughs> you need, as you say, you need to be uh, flexible. Um, I, I know on some of the ICAO groups, there's discussions, and, and I suspect this comes from industry. It's quite difficult to search for non-cooperative traffic. Uh, especially, as you say before, you've got a, a Gary, I think it's mentioned it, the protection of controlled airspace. If you're in controlled airspace where there is no unknown traffic, so, you know, classes D for most member states, but certainly BCA, um, you you know there's no one else in there. But do you actually know that? And you go back to the occasional sad mid-air disaster, Gol Air is a classic one in Brazil that was a ghost aircraft because the transponder was switched off. That last level of collision avoidance is the pilot looking out the window. And with a lot of uh, you know high quality, uh, popular large RPAs, we still don't have that ability. Um, why do you look for non-cooperative traffic? Will you have non-cooperative drones involved in this uh, project? I think you said you would. And, and the reason for that is why? So we feel it's really important when we imagine that future airspace, we imagine a scenario actually where not everyone is doing the right thing, right? Um, and if you if you're trying to, to to imagine that that true vertical slice through everyday normal operations, actually, if you are an airport, one of the biggest concerns that you have is someone being somewhere they shouldn't be, and actually, drones are a huge and, and growing concern. Um, so it, you can't have a UTM system, in our view, that doesn't have at least as an equal partner in that all of the uncooperative folks in mind. And like I say earlier on, you know, you're going to have folks that are deliberately doing something that they shouldn't be. Uh, you know, that, that could be your, your terrorist style incident. Or, and you're going to have people who are accidentally doing the wrong thing. But the point is, in many instances, the effect is similar. You're looking at endangering an aircraft, potentially closing an airfield. Um, the list goes on. So, you know, the UTM, any UTM system should be able to blend what it can see in the ATM world and what it can see in the UTM world. But then just like you have surveillance technology in the ATM world, we need surveillance technology for drones. And like I say, I think I mentioned earlier on, we've got um, DJI, Vodafone and uh, D-Drone who are providing um, various drone detection solutions that the UTM has integrated with. And as the operating system provider, we'll continue to provide essentially open integrations for other sense manufacturers as well. Um, but it's clear, you know, each system has various different pros and various different cons, just like radar can't see through hills, for example. You know, it's a, it's a very interesting space when you come to trying to, to, to have full uh, visibility on everything that transits the, the air. Um, so bring it, bringing that together and then standardizing that is, is our core function, if you like. And it's, um, it's a really tough problem. It is a really tough problem. I mean, you, you hit on it from a quality point of view earlier, I mean, not every system is equal and something that starts out really, really well as it transits could, could end up talking to you instead of, you know, five times a second is now talking to you once a minute and, and you have very different, um, communications, um, technologies available. And that's yeah, the final okay. part of, of that case for us is, you know, if you do imagine deploying this now, then, you know, one of the questions we get asked a lot is, you know, what, what does your UTM need? Do you need 2G? Do you need 3G? Do you need 4G? Do you need 5G? And we say, we don't really care. You know, it, it's down to you. We have a minimum bandwidth requirement. You could use satellite. You could use private radio. We have, you know, customers of ours use Airwave, for example, which is a private um, spectrum. Um, it's up to you. And actually, whatever is the flavor of the day today in 10 years probably won't be. 
Um, so, you know, we're communications technology agnostic, but a key function of our protocols is instrumentation around that technology so that we can factor it in as a, um, as a consideration in, in UTM operations. And, and as you say earlier, latency is a massive part of that. Accuracy is the other part. Your um, protocol, if I can just jump in very quickly, your, your message is an open standard, I believe, that you've got. Yep. So we have a, a wide open developer platform today. We're wide open as a book and anyone can go along and have a look. We've also contributed our flight reporting standard um, to Gutma. So that's an open standard that any global UTM association member or non-member can, can come and read and implement. Um, and that was really a protocol designed to allow various different UTM companies or USS providers, depending on your persuasion in life, to be able to exchange information about where flights are taking place and when, but minus the who. Uh, because the who, you know, we all have an obligation to protect the personal information of the customers we represent, but then provided digital, digital communications mechanisms to interrogate that information with authority. Because that is one of those weird modern world things, isn't it, where you could have loads of UTMs stood up with their own uh, particular brand of communication uh, to phone home. And if they don't talk to each other, then, then there's a whole load of traffic you're missing there as well, which it's is something exactly. we're weirdly standing up in the modern world. I'm quite interested in your trials. Did you bring in the uh, counter UAS stuff as well? Were they in, in the trials? Um, so if by that, do you mean, have we got anyone shooting drones down? <laughs> no, 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 uh, no, not uh, just the, um, the the detection systems, because I wondered if you had already detected anybody flying around your trial area yeah, that was unknown to you. Yeah, okay. So actually in, in rehearsals, one of the locations that we um, are using as part of our operational theater, because it's nicely within the CTR and, and a little bit away from the airport, is a cricket club. Um, a nice big open field, lots of space. We can control who goes in and out. So it makes a lot of sense to, to base ourselves there. Um, and whilst we were doing flight trials, um, the one of the drone detection systems picked up um, what we believe was a Phantom, Phantom 4, um, about 600 meters away. So it was actually really close. Um, and of course, you know, the great thing is the UTM system was able to to see that because of the the counter drone system that was installed. I think it was actually the DJI Aeroscope system that provided that telemetry to us. Um, but of course, that that's that's just one source of information. Until you know that it shouldn't be there, you don't know what the problem is. Um, so the UTM, our UTM system in this case, highlighted that drone as rogue, and it was very visually displayed on the screen as a for us, it's a red icon with a big crosshair around it because it really wants your attention. Um, but as we go through each scenario, um, we have the capability to identify certain drones as friend. They set, you know, essentially, you know, we can understand the identity code of that. Um, and everything else, therefore, becomes uh, a consideration which we might need to take from a safety perspective. It's very interesting. You didn't actually mention, I should have mentioned, sorry, is um, we have the concept of cooperative drones that have a, an ADS-B device provided by UAVionics as well. So UAVionics makes something called a ping. Um, you know, you get your ICAO code, you plug that into the drone, um, you attach it to your, to your drone, rather. Um, so it doesn't really matter. There you go. We have a, an excellent example of, of one there. So actually, what you do when you're about to, to take off in Altitude Angel, you you file your flight with us and you tell us what your ICAO transponder code is for your ADSB. That will mean the, ADA, the UTM system can look at the various sensor streams we've got and correlate that data so that we know, for example, that that drone belongs to David, um, rather than just seeing you as, a, as an ADSB target, but not knowing that we can communicate with you. Um, so again, so then, um, on the day, so, right? so yeah, so let's, so or let's say David, that takes that very device with him and he goes and flies uh, just outside of the CTR, just outside of uh, your zone, but David's registered with you, and you, you know, so it pops up and you go, uh, and then your, your your system says, oh, yeah, that's David. And you say, oh, David, the gang's all over here at the airport. Come and join us for a beer. Or, hey, David, don't you want to do... Would you then Would you then send important messages directly to David's phone, for instance, via text or whatever, or, or bring him into the picture. Yeah, so if we, by definition of the fact that if we know what the transponder code is on David's drone, that means he's used our apps or he's used a flight planning tool. Perhaps he's used one of our partners who also integrate with us. Um, that would mean we would have a mechanism for reaching out to him 
in the event that there is a situation that he needs to know about. Um, as I say, we have the strategic deconfliction, which will run first. So hopefully that will mean you'll get a, you know, an instantaneous decision. Please do not turn your drone on here. This is a very bad idea because where you're planning to be right now, there's a helicopter and five drones and an aircraft. Um, you know, that, that kind of communication will take place. But we won't we'll know he's there until he's airborne um, because the nature of ADSB. He'll be below the tree line, which was an issue we discovered um, earlier on. However, one of the great things we've been able to do is install the UAvionics transceiver at the tower at Manchester Airport. So it does give us a little bit of better visibility. Uh, well, but funny like, enough, I, I tried to get on the guys from Involi, who um, are probably down the pub, very, very nice people who came and impressed me no end uh, in Tanzania because they came and did what they said that they were going to do. And they they are installing receivers all over the place for FLAM, ADSB, and so on and so forth. So hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get, get them along. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that is, at the end of the day, just the function of the number of receivers that you have within the area of operation. Um, and then that would lead me to then ask you, are you going to rely on the civil aviation authorities, only the civil aviation authorities ones? Do you rely on or do you pull in data from citizen sources? Uh, how, how does that work? So, I mean, across the platform today, we have about 80 different data sources that we use, ranging from everything from aeronautical data, environmental data, geospatial data, telemetry, surveillance. Um, and one source we use is public and commercially available ADSB feeds. Um, quality is always an issue with those, uh, as is latency. Um, you know, as this becomes very clear if you take a commercial ADSB feed um, from, you know, you pick your, your providers, but we've, we've tested them all. I've well, got one on now, haven't I? Oh, yeah. oh yes. Um, um, and then if you overlay, I'll work this all the, out. Uh, work it all out. <laughs> you overlay that with the Manchester radar and you see just how far behind it is. Um, so again, this creates an interesting issue for us because obviously the UTM has to provide some correlation to those things. Um, so, you know, as always, you know, we're, we're a very open book, um, very happy to have conversations with folks on these things. And we don't profess to have, you know, all of the answers to all of the questions that are out there. In fact, part of the work that we're doing is to, is to shine a light on some of the very big gaps and the very big problems that exist. Um, but that comes back to that core mes message of Zenith is even with all of these unknowns right now, it's still possible to do something which satisfies not just the regulators, but all of the operators whose licenses and careers are on the line to do this stuff safely. Um, so we can still make meaningful advancements while asking the right questions, um, but that only works with that cooperation and collaboration. You don't see that typically in the UTM world today because everyone's making a bit of a land grab. Yeah, well, that's the whole of this this industry. You just pick any any point to any part of it, and it's a land grab. So, is it fair to say then you're trying to generate a a greater situational picture, greater air picture than than than's been available his, historically? Um, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, you know, one of the one of the really nice things that happened in the rehearsals, and uh, you know, we weren't recording this, um, which is I'm always going to be very upset about. But we had um, obviously I, I mentioned we had the participation from the National Police Air Service, um, and they're flying around. You know, I think it's a, a crew of four, and on the back seat, uh, not the pilot, uh, one of the operators has a console which shows ADSB traffic. Um, and one of the concerns that NPAS have, like a lot of helicopter pilots, particularly if they're going to be landing in you know, nice fields and things like that, um, places you find drones, is that they feel a little bit vulnerable. And you know, we're doing this um, uh, demonstration with the NPAS guys who were remarkably supportive, has to be said, you know, gave us a lot of their time, um, a lot of their um, experience. And as they were coming into our operational theater, we were broadcasting via a drone detection system um, which we then converted that into an ADS-B target, the location of our rogue drone. And it, you know, to our UTM, it was a rogue drone. It was not sending us its telemetry. We had no prior records or knowledge of where it was going to be. It was just managed through the safety case, and we knew we were expecting a rogue drone. And the uh, helicopter operator came running over, a very nice lady. She came running over, and she said, I recognize your logo. I've just seen it appear on my console. What you guys are doing, I think that's going to save lives. And we thought that was a fantastic moment because what we'd just done was give back situation intelligence 
using equipment that's already installed on many aircraft today. We didn't require new apps. We didn't ask the pilot to do anything different. We were just able to show that 978 feet below NPAS was a rogue drone. And that helped them pick a better landing location. So, you know, for us, it, it is two way. And that's why we say any, any UTM that doesn't have that core capability of first incorporating cooperative and uncooperative traffic on the drone side, but then also being able to talk back and integrate through existing ATM systems, it's really just operating in a snow globe. And you can't run an airspace situation picture with half, you know, with one eye closed. You need, you need to have that ubiquitous um, situation awareness. In fact, um, we can ask our, our friendly air traffic controller, you know, you, you can't really afford to, to lose sight there. That's a, that's a great question and uh, and one I'm not going to get stuck into. No, uh, you know, the, 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 <laughs> I know you guys have the radios more than the radars, but you know, <laughs> it's preferable right. to have, yeah. uh, have to, to know where everything is, right? Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, there's a balance. The trade off of all of that is, and that, and that is um, the se sector capacity. I mean, sector is not the correct term because the sector quite often means an en route position, but certainly even in the terminal area or on a tower or on a uh, surface movement control, there's a capacity that you can handle. And, and that capacity quickly changes when unusual events uh, occur. Um, I, I admit, Richard, you were talking before about where some of your uh, surveillance is coming through from, whether it be 3G or LTE or whatever. And then I, my conservatism wanted me to hop up on my Zimmer frame and go back to retirement. Um, however, <laughs> to, to be honest, you know, uh, 70, 80 years ago, um, air traffic control started using radar. And, and this was, you know, there's some major events. That wasn't in my career, by the way. It was only just outside of it. But we started using radar. And then we started getting jet engine, jet aircraft, and pressurized aircraft. And, and things, wave if you can still hear me, things changed quite quickly. Are good. Um, however, you know, 70 years ago, the first radars were used. And someone said, well, let's separate. What are we going to separate by? Well, a thousand feet, five miles. You know, they, they plucked that out of their hat. And who knows? It could have been at Manchester. Um, but <laughs> let's look down the path 20 or 30 years and the stuff that you're doing now, uh, you know, will we'll probably be recorded and could be still used. Who knows? It's very exciting. I, uh, yeah, I mean... This is a source of a lot of consternation in, inside our company. And actually, the, the sheer amount of discussion that takes place before we cut the line of code is really important. Um, and actually, one of the biggest considerations we've got is, you know, there are no rules of the air for drones, right? Beyond, you know, stay, stay below 400 feet and don't go beyond visual line of sight. So we don't really know what should happen if the UTM is tracking two, um, you know, two drones heading towards each other. You know, do you both turn left? Do you both turn right? Do you separate by 500 feet? five centimeters like what is the appropriate values for those algorithms and actually to help try and answer those questions we use a lot of simulation and a lot of automation and we did a lot of testing with both microsoft and imperial college london um late last year where we ran such simulations and we found out you know we, we could probably pack the airspace a lot more than most people would be comfortable with but but that's not the only reason right capacity is not the only reason that you set certain um certain limits around aircraft you also do it because you also need to have a failover in the event that something goes wrong um so i agree with you you know this stuff isn't isn't set in stone um, one of the concepts we will actually be demonstrating in uh, Operation Zenith is our sort of dynamic adjustment of these management regions, as we call them, around aircraft that move through our UTM. So broadly and very crudely speaking, a faster fixed wing aircraft will have a bigger region of management around it than a smaller rotary aircraft. Um, because we know actually with certainty, the faster you are and the bigger your, your wings are and the, the heavier you are, the more likelihood you, we're going to be able to predict where you're going to be in the next second or two. But actually, if you're really small and really nimble, um, like a small Phantom 4 or something like that, um, you can change direction a lot quicker and you could end up anywhere. So, you know, being able to design algorithms that cater for these things is certainly one thing, but then knowing what values to plug in is the other. And this is where we, we kind of, I realize I'm going on, so I'll wrap this up. Um, this is where, actually, as the UTM provider, we feel that it's a, it should really be a national decision, a national operation, and a service that someone like an ANSP offers to 
all other UTM providers that want to operate. Because those kind of behaviors, those kind of rules, you can't leave to people to independently implement. You also need to know that if, you know, say on a Sunday evening, you've gone to bed on rules of the air version one for drones, and on Monday morning, um, rules of the air version 1.1 come into effect, you need to I need a cast iron guarantee that all of those automated vehicles will pick that up. And actually, commercial entities, I am a commercial entity, you know, you'll make commercial decisions that might not match the regulated one. Um, so certain times, you know, you have to you have to advocate for for what's right. And we certainly do. Uh, we certainly do feel that actually a regulated entity, in this case, Nats in the UK, is the prime uh, is the prime resource to be running that national UTM fabric, those basic orchestration functions, the separation services we already entrust them to provide. Um, and our role here is to give them the technology to do that um, and provide all of that configuration so that people who whose sole purpose in life, their sole job is airspace safety and airspace design can, can take that technology and do amazing things with it. That's what we're trying to do. Fair play. <laughs> what can I say? Fair play. Um, it, it is, it's, it's interesting that you'll think, I, I think we see a lot of, not well, say say see a lot. There's only a handful of people really trying in the UTO space, and they're very much are thinking about how they can sew the deals up this month, <laughs> not ten years time. They're not looking ten years ahead. They're looking a month or two ahead, and and shouting and crying about abilities that perhaps they don't actually have. Um, and it'll be interesting to see exactly which manufacturers I'm going to try and fish from you now uh, of course we know one UTM recently lost a major manufacturer um, uh, or the support of a major manufacturer um, do you think it will be important at the end if uh, several you know if, if manufacturers line up behind certain brands and not the others will that be the make and break of some companies um, I think you know manufacturers no denying it, right without manufacturers we don't really have a drone industry <laughs> um, and whatever the pre predominant drone manufacturers like do are likely to become sort of emergent standards um, you know in terms of UTM however I mean I think it, we have to make a differentiation between kind of commercial airframe manufacturers and and certainly more consumer orientated um, uh, manufacturers and then of course you've got folks who kind of do both um i think the most important thing to remember right now is that i think most manufacturers around the world aren't really under any obligation to integrate with the utm uh, certainly mm, for kind of control mm, right um mm. and actually as a utm provider there are no mandated standards that apply to us um so whereas i think those initial collaborations actually make a lot of impact in the industry because actually you're saying right well we recognize that there is an issue we want to solve so you're going to have a manufacturer and a UTM company come together to say, right, well, let's work on this particular problem. And I think we have to look at the alliances that are being formed and how they're changing over time to work out where the industry thinks it's going to be able to to, um, to get the value that it needs going forwards. Obviously, we are going way over time. We've gone, through, <laughs> we've gone way over time here. <laughs> oh, yeah. so, I, I, it's, no, that's no, all. It's all good. I, I yeah, I'm, I'm very. Very glad that David could join us uh, to, to talk about this because he's uh, an expert on subjects. It's not just me ranting at you as normal. Um, but I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this all shapes out in the next um, five or ten years. And uh, um, hopefully I'll get to go back to Tanzania and see how the next version of that all looks. And I've got to ch I know I've got to change my mindset. Got to change my thinking a bit, bit, bit become a bit more forward-looking, uh, but I was horrified that uh, somebody released the machine into the air and didn't really know what was going on around them. <laughs> I was relying a load of other people to tell them, but that's just me. Um, and Walter, we, you've had uh, Nick Lysis asking questions in here about about uh, winglets and things like that, so maybe he can um, maybe he can email you at work and uh, he yes. can. Catch up with you, and uh, and if it's in the UK, you can go to the show. And Nicola, what have you made while we've been ranting? Uh, nothing really. Just figured out the this book boost thing is not really working, so I have to throw it in the bin and order another one. But... Okay, so online shopping, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, 
but this is going to be part of the uh, solar generator box i'll be building that will power my ground station in a box thing when it's finally completed so it's all rc related in some way very good. Uh, you did release you released the video of that little tiny wing. I think it's behind you that you were very impressed with. What's it? 800, 800 mil, something like yeah, that. Right up there. It's six hundred centimeters. Uh, sixty centimeters actually. It's right. stuffed like a Christmas turkey on the inside, although its size is not the same. size. Size is and everything, as they say. Yes, indeed. Yes, yeah, indeed. but pr pretty impressive little plane i mean that 4s 850 milliamp hour battery just sends it further than i thought it would i mean it it, it is able to gain altitude at 10 meters a second which yeah. is it's quick. which is quite impressive yeah <laughs> quite impressive and once once you get up to two kilometers and at some point you think okay that's a 350 gram yes and it's at 80 kilometers, some kilometers in the distance and just the thought of it it's like a i don't know it's like a newspaper flying up there <laughs> but it, but it, it's good it's impressive i don't know i didn't think it'd be that interesting with this little thing i'm just gonna keep pushing it see if i can lose it or what else i can do with it <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you can manage that, and uh, Divya, you can find that on Archangel RC. That's Nicholas' yeah. channel. Uh, Richard, I have to say thank you very much to you for joining us and to taking flack as ever. Always a good sport. And David, I hope we can have you back again. And um, dear viewers, thank you very much. We were well over time. Don't forget 2100 GMT next Tuesday. Thanks for watching. Have a lovely weekend. Look after yourselves and be safe if you're flying. Bye for now. Bye all. Cheers, chaps. Cheers, everyone. Bye.